Hello, I'm Nick, and this is Today in Philosophy of History for Friday, 29 December, 2023. Today is the 235th anniversary of the birth of Christian Jurgensen Thompson, who was born on this day in 1788. Thompson lived during what is sometimes called the Danish Golden Age, which roughly ran from 1800 to 1850, which is known for its painting and its neoclassical architecture. It was also a time in which Danish society, especially in Copenhagen, was, was very vibrant. And Thompson was what you could call a gentleman antiquarian. And he was given the task of organizing the national uh, collections, though well, the collection that would become someday the National Museum of uh, Denmark. Uh, let me bring up a picture of Thompson here. And uh, at, at, at this time, there were a lot of artifacts that were being discovered from the Danish prehistory, and they needed uh, someone to manage them and display them. Um, one particular uh, artifact of interest was called the Brudevelt Lures, which were discovered in 1797 when, uh, when Thompson was child. Thompson wrote a book about uh, the Danish antiquities in 1836, was translated into English in 1848 as Guide to Northern Archaeology. And here is his entry on the Brudevelt Lures. Quote, trumpets of bronze of a very large size and consisting usually of two parts where one was inserted into the other and of the appearance of which an idea may be formed from the annexed cut. They are generally found along with bronze swords and belong consequently to the more ancient period of paganism, as is also indicated by the ornaments. The inferior extremity is adorned with a circular disc, the anterior side of which is ornamented. From the mouthpiece depend ornaments of bronze and on some of them there are contrivances for the insertion of cords. On one specimen, a long metal chain is preserved. They have been found in bogs in several parts of Denmark, so well preserved that they may be still be sounded, unquote. Uh, there were other um, great finds that were to come along after Thompson's time, like the Trondholm Sun Chariot, discovered in 1902, the Vexo Helmets, discovered in 1942, Tolan Man. There are many bog bodies. This is one of the best preserved, uh, found in 1950. The Tolentz Battlefield and all the artifacts there from which discovered in 1996 was in northern Germany, uh, as was the Nebraskaitis discovered in 1999, also in northern Germany. But these areas were contiguous and would have been part of the same or related cultures in the far north of, of Europe. Uh, you can walk between Denmark and northern Germany. So it's essentially the same contiguous territory. So at Thompson is, oh, here's a, um, uh, an artist's conception of these items uh, as they may have been in use. You can see in the upper left-hand corner, there are the horns, uh, the procession here, they're carrying uh, bronze discs, like assumed to represent the sun as in the Trunholm sun uh, chariot. And in the lower uh, foreground right, you can see uh, pictographs of ships, which are common set in Scandinavia. What Thompson is best known for is his, what's come to be called the three age system. So in displaying the artifacts in which he had been given charge, he divided them into the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. And this come to be called the three age system. And it proved to be very successful and other museum curators and historians have taken it up and they have expanded it and extrapolated it. For example, it's often the case now that the Chalcolithic Age or Copper Age is added between the Stone Age and the Bronze Age because there was a period in which copper was worked before it was learned to um, integrate uh, tin and other uh, metals into the ore to, to, to come up with a, a, a alloy that's uh, 
stiffer and stronger than copper alone, which is bronze holds an edge better for weapons that is less likely to fold in the midst of battle. It's also common to uh, uh, divide the, the Stone Age into the Paleolithic or own Stone Age and into the and the Neolithic, the new Stone Age. And you can even uh, add a Mesolithic. So you have an old Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, New Stone Age, Chocolithic Age, Copper Age, in other words, Bronze Age and Iron Age. So this represents a sequence of, you could say, increasing technology. Part of it is the ability to create a fire hot enough. So um, bronze melts at 1,675 degrees Fahrenheit. Copper actually melts at a little higher temperature, 1,984 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it takes a much hotter fire to melt iron. 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, steel melts a little bit lower. So uh, about 2,500 Fahrenheit. So you've got a couple of different technological processes going on here. The ability to uh, have a, 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 a hotter furnace, which requires, you know, bellows to and, and the use of charcoal and whatever else it takes to get a much hotter fire. And then the other technology of learning how to combine other elements, other other metals in with the with the copper, like tin is usually, but there are many different uh, alloys of, of bronze used other metals to get a, a better a better metal for implements and especially for for weapons. So Thompson's work was taken up in this way and has become very widely used and it's extrapolated, especially in the past. But we could also extrapolate it into the future. Uh, after the Iron Age, we could say there's a steel age and after steel and aluminum age and after aluminum titanium age. Aluminum wasn't processed on a large scale until the late 19th century when the method of electrolysis was discovered. And titanium wasn't processed at a large scale until the middle of the 20th century. So these two both take significantly greater technologies and all, all the way up to steel were, were realized in the ancient world. Uh, you don't get aluminum and titanium used until you have much higher technology into the 19th and 20th centuries. And then you're also using these uh, metals in higher technologies that could not have been built earlier, like aerospace applications where aluminum and titanium are used significantly. But all of this started out with uh, with Thompson's uh, classification of artifacts for display in the, the museum that would become the National Museum of Denmark. So powerful ideas about history which shape our understanding of the world can emerge from museums and how they display and curate their collection. And that was the case with with Thompson. Museums are essentially institutions of public instruction. And a national museum in the center, of, in, the, in a capital city, uh, can have enormous intellectual influence on the uh, population. So we can contrast the work of Thompson to Franz Boas who lived from uh, 1858 to 1942. Boaz is remembered as an anthropologist and a social theorist, but he was also very interested in how collections are to be displayed. Obviously these two things interact because what theory you have in history is going to influence how you display artifacts in a museum and vice versa. Uh, Boaz wrote a paper that appeared in the 17 June 1887 issue of Science uh, under Museums of Ethnology and their classification. I'm going to quote here. The main object of ethnological collections should be the dissemination of the fact that civilization is not something absolute, but that it is relative, and that our ideas and conceptions are true only so far as civilization goes. I believe that this object can be accomplished only by the tribal arrangement of collections. The second object, which is subordinate to the other, is to show how far each and every civilization is the outcome of its geographical and historical surroundings. 
here the line of tribal arrangement may be sometimes be broken in order to show a, an historical series of specimens. But I consider this latter point of view subordinate to the former and should choose to arrange collections of duplicates for illumin illustrating these ideas, as it were, as an explanation of the facts contained in the tribal series, unquote. So this is a very different way of displaying artifacts and very different way of thinking about history than what Thompson had in mind. What Thompson did is what we would today call cultural evolution, cultural evolutionism. And we may contrast this to uh, the Boazian paradigm, which we've come to call cultural relativism. So Boaz was arguing against the kind of cultural evolutionism implicit in Thompson's three-age system. And he urged that uh, um, museums should display their artifacts. So you have, you know, one culture here, one culture there, and not in a series of increasing increments of technological progress, because that involves the concept of progress, and that implies something that's not relative, but absolute. Uh, but Boaz was incredibly influential. He had a lot of students. Uh, Ruth Benedict was one of his students. They went on to influence academia in a very big way. And it wasn't until the middle of the 20th century and after the second half of the 20th century that archaeologists, anthropologists started to find other ways of, of, of arriving at a kind of cultural evolutionism. So, for example, Elman Service had a sequence of, of social organization from band to tribe to chiefdom to, to state uh, that could be considered a form of cultural evolutionism. But it, it, there was a lot of work that went on between Boaz's influence, uh, which was generally against that, and, and the people who wanted to bring the cultural evolution back into the mix of ideas of history and archaeology. Boaz was so influential that you could probably say that he influenced philosophy of history more than most philosophers of history themselves, simply because of his influence over the thought of the time was so great. So you could say Thompson isn't well known as well known as Boaz, but you could say that he's almost as influential, or perhaps as influential, because who hasn't heard of the three age system? Everybody's heard of that. You you don't remember when you first heard about it that because it's been around and it's it's been part of your intellectual uh, milieu for so long that it's just part of what everybody knows. You know, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. So both cultural evolutionism and cultural relativism are pervasively present in our thought. And we rarely realize how often we invoke them. In fact, both of them may be in our thoughts at the same time. We, we don't even realize that we, we judge one thing uh, according to cultural relativism and another thing according to cultural evolutionism. So here's another quote from Thompson's Guide to Northern Archaeology that I found very interesting. Quote, the study of the Greek and Latin languages has given birth to modern philology. By the example of the classical historians, modern history has attained its eminence, of which fact there can be but one opinion among men of scientific acquirement. None but the uninstructed and superficial observer would describe the movement of a machine to the great external and visible wheels without taking into account the inner principle of motion. But with the remains of the old classical literature, the moderns have moreover combined a new spirit of intellectual activity, sprung indeed from an ancient root, but which by degrees has expanded into a new tree with another stem and bearing other fruit. The knowledge of the old time embraced man, that of our time nature at large, the special subjects of the labors of antiquity were mythology, language, history, as also philosophy, or in other words, the history of man. But in modern times has been added to these is the knowledge of the world in all its departments, or in general terms, the history of nature. The latter could not have sprung into existence without the former, no Laplace without a Euclid. But the later development of knowledge has placed such a distance between the two that they may be considered as independent of each other. Both together complete the culture of the human intellect. If we inquire under which of these two modes of intellectual activity the old northern literature is to be classed, 
the natural answer must be under that of the olden time. It contains, like the Greek and the Romans, scarcely any other element other than the religious any of any other element than the religious, the historical and the linguistic, the philosophical is wanting. To require more from that in virtue of its nature it could afford would be unreasonable, unquote. So we find here um, another expression of Thompson's cultural evolutionism. No, no Laplace without a Euclid. You need this series of stepwise increases in conceptual sophistication and technological system sophistication and uh, you also there's also another idea in this passage which is um, the, the the nomological uh, ordering of, of things which is fully consonant with the idea of cultural historian nomological means law like so we're talking about uh, a, a law lack number of steps that might be formulated in a, a law of, of science or a law of nature and he really wants to get at the the uh, the inner fundamental principle. But he says the inner principle of motion and is that's responsible for this great machine of history. He's not interested in the superficial aspects. He wants to get to the laws, as it were. He doesn't say the laws of history, but essentially that's what we're talking about, and that's largely what cultural relativists oppose and and many you know Karl Popper under the title of historicism uh, rejected the very possibility there could be anything like that and this is the large controversy in philosophy of history between the nomothetic and the ideographic uh, or the the, the law-like and the particularistic or the universal and the particularistic so all of these things that uh, Thompson was writing about in the middle of the 19th century, 150 years later, they're, they're still very much with us. Um, we still uh, have you know, traditional historians who would prefer not to expand history in this way into prehistory and the history of nature. Um, and we have others who are very um, enthusiastic about it. The, current school of historiography known as big history emphasizes the history of the entire universe from the big bang to the present and into the future as long as we can predict it and they 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 are very much cut from the same cloth as thompson because thompson sees this complete continuity between you know human history is now embedded within natural history and we tell the whole story but that that's one conception of history and not everybody um, abides by that or is interested in pursuing that particular model. If you take, for example, an idealistic philosophy of history like Collingwood, Collingwood thought that the only thing that you can properly call history is something that has an inner life to it that the individual can enter into and, and reconstruct the thoughts of the past in their own mind. So happy birthday, Christopher, Chris, Christian Jurgensen Thompson, and uh, thanks for listening.